The reputation of the Disney sequel is so far intermittently in flux. By that I mean the amount of quality you imagine when you hear the words Disney sequel tends to jump around like House of Pain based on what time period it's happening in. We are currently in a moment where they tend to be big budget affairs released in theaters as proper Disney animated films with press runs and hype trains from the company and almost always raking in piles of cash in turn, no matter how bad they are and no matter how much they may stain the reputation of the original. No matter how- This is a recent phenomenon though, Disney didn't even deal in sequels for a long time. Their first animated feature, Snow White, you might have heard of her, dropped in 1937, and their first proper sequel was The Rescuers Down Under in 1990, which was, in turn, a sequel to a movie that had come out well over a decade earlier in 1977. Gentlemen, this is Democracy Manifest. This was during the Disney Renaissance when the company was pushing creative boundaries, trying to beef up their artistic reputation and box office returns alike after nearly three decades of struggling. While The Rescuers Down Under was well received critically, it didn't do so well in terms of financial returns, and it ends up looking a little bit out of place next to the powerhouses that came out later on, like Aladdin and Beauty and the Beast. But the 90s were definitely a boom era for Disney, and then CEO Michael Eisner Hello? was in a period of particularly high creative success and business savvy. Yes, not every bold idea he crafted was a winner, but they were usually bold indeed and many of the choices instituted during his time did pay high dividends for the company, the concept of the direct-to-video Disney sequel among them. The second era of the Disney sequel, the direct-to-video period, is the one that came right before our current state. From the early 90s to the mid-aughts, Disney capitalized on its ever-growing library of beloved films and its backlog alike with sequels and prequels that went straight to home release. These were typically much cheaper in terms of production value, which meant they were often animated by Disney's television animation branches rather than their main feature film staff. This went hand in hand with an adjacent strategy of using tie-in shows on the company's television networks like Toon Disney and the Disney Channel. Like, yes, Disney is known as the big daddy of IP wielding now, but the stage was really getting set here. Beginning with Aladdin 2, The Return of Jafar in 1994, Disney regularly pumped these films out to keep the money flowing. For some reason, Peter Pan 2 and The Jungle Book 2 came out in theaters, I don't know what that was about. But evidently, it didn't do what they wanted because sequels stayed out of theaters until Ralph broke the internet. And boy, you don't want to know how I feel about that! The DTV formula was pretty consistent. A sequel or a prequel that uses the same familiar characters and universe as the original movie, usually placed in a conflict with some pretty low stakes. Cinderella 2, for example, was a series of mostly pointless vignettes about post-marriage life for Prince Charming and Cindy. Tarzan 2 used the film's narrative gaps in Tarzan's childhood years to have a silly story where George Carlin plays a monkey. Okay, sure. And a lot of these were just sequels about the main characters having children or like navigating their new status quo, yada yada, so on and so forth, etc, etc. It goes without saying that a lot of these were, to use a highbrow film critic term, not good. Disney had the home release market locked up like Fort Knox at this point, and I know because I was part of the problem. They employed methods like the Disney Vault to drive sales with exclusivity and transient availability. Don't miss your last chance to own the fun of Bambi. Mama! and the heartwarming adventure of Lady and the Tramp. Get going. Because on January 31st, these Disney classics are going back into the vault. Also going away, Lady and the Tramp 2. Creating special diamond or black diamond editions to further the veneer of, I have to buy this. In truth, the peak of Disney's physical release strategies and their successes were probably the canary in the coal mine for Disney phoning it in, rehashing, and doing as little as possible to easily cash in on reliable IPs, a method they rely on like it's their job at this point. For context, The Return of Jafar pushed 15 million copies and netted Disney a gross of 60 times its original budget while earning the title of one of the best-selling home movie video releases in the history of the medium. So of course they were all in on this. These films were kinda lazy, usually forgettable at best, and pretty formulaic if they even had a cohesive formula. All, all except one that is.
An extremely goofy movie came out on Leap Day 2000, a sequel to the 1995 feature film A Goofy Movie, and frankly the fact that it got made at all is a little bit of something. Unlike other Disney Renaissance era films, A Goofy Movie was not a smash success. It got middling reviews by critics and had a very modest box office. The poor thing was struggling from the moment it came into the world, to be quite honest. Unlike other Disney theatrical releases at the time, Goofy Movie was one of the only feature films the studio has ever made that was based on a Disney Disney television series, in this case, Goof Troop. There were a handful of original Disney show properties that got films made for them around this time, and the results generally ran the gamut from a resounding, well, I guess, to, uh oh! A Goofy Movie occupied a weird spot in a lot of ways, of course. While its box office numbers were unremarkable, especially next to juggernauts like The Lion King the year before, it did really well in home release and its star quickly rose among Disney fans. I cannot prove this in data, but I can say with pretty big confidence that A Goofy Movie's popularity has probably far outpaced Goof Troop. Unlike a lot of Renaissance films, A Goofy Movie is very decidedly of its time. It is extremely 90s, oh man! I don't know if they still make girls like this, but oh boy, they were everywhere. And yet, despite its lack of timelessness, I feel like with every passing year, this film's presence in Disney merch, parks, and pandering swells to even bigger heights. And I mean, I get it, it's one of my favorite Disney movies. So, with the cards aligned, namely a case of sequel fever and Goofy Movie VHS money pouring in, a Goofy Movie sequel was put on the docket. So what's it gonna be? Max and Roxanne raising a family? A prequel set in the Goof Troop timeline? Or- wait, what? what what's going on? What? What? <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, he on X Games mode. I don't know how to tell you this, but an extremely goofy movie is what I call a perfect film. And the core reasoning for that is that absolutely fucking none of it makes sense. I could not for the life of me tell you who this movie was supposed to appeal to, but I feel like for all intents and purposes, it should not have been a five-year-old child such as myself in February 2000. And yet, it did. Big time. Huge. Huge. I watched this movie like I was being graded on it. I ran those tape ribbons like it was the Summer Olympics. I'm pretty sure I watched this movie far more than the original, and I'm not sure I could fully tell you why, but I'll give it a shot, why not? The production team took an interesting angle with this one. It is, in fact, a sequel, not a prequel, set roughly five years after the events of a Goofy movie. Yes, five. Math break. Max is apparently 14 in the original, on the end of what I can only assume is his freshman year of high school. Sure, fine, that's how old I was when I finished ninth grade, but in this movie, he's about to go off to college and is 19? And presumably PJ and Bobby are too. Did they all get held back? Did Mazer hold them back for the power line thing? Did they do a year at community college? How are we going to get two minutes of slam poetry, but no answers for these pressing questions? Eisner! Eisner! Hello? Sorry, I'm, I'm losing the plot, and boy, is there plot. I'm not a recap guy, so I'm just gonna lay down the basics. Max goes to college, but Goofy gets fired and discovers he needs to take one more year of school to get his degree and get a new job. So he attends college with Max for his freshman year. Okay, up to speed. Welcome. From the jump, there are already some, uh, curiosities. Max is 19. Mm -hmm. And he is headed off to College State University College State Tech with PJ and Bobby because I guess they all gotten together. Sure, I'll believe that. Max and Bobby had the same SAT score, whatever, I'm already here. But their ambitions in higher education are not a degree or a career or even scamming on anthropomorphic art majors. Nay, they want to win the College X Games. Did I mention there is a lot of ESPN advertising in this movie? Oh boy. Uh, so here's the thing, in case you weren't aware, Disney owns ESPN. It owns ESPN Plus. Disney World has an ESPN sports complex. ESPN was acquired by the Walt Disney Company around 1996, so after a goofy movie, but before this thing. It's worth noting as well that the College X Games are not technically a thing that really exists. There is the X Games, a general series of action sports events that began a year prior to the acquisition in summer 1995, but no college. But like I said, the cards aligned, the shoehorns were at the ready, the boardrooms were alight. They thought, man, we could use some synergy. But we don't want to be too obstructive. I imagine they looked at what was cooking for this movie and said, yes sir, put my product placement in that one. And here we are. 
Monopolies are bad. Anyway, this movie is also notably bursting with references to 1970s pop culture. The framework this operates in is that Goofy was in college in the 70s, and as such, it's a theme that's sprinkled in throughout. He bonds with his girlfriend Sylvia, the college's librarian, over their shared love for 70s nostalgia. They have that one disco sequence, and the movie's soundtrack is filled with songs from that era. And a lot of them are covers, which means Disney paid these musicians to come into the studio and record these in-house. Also, that these covers are really hard to get a good hold of because they only seem to exist on the soundtrack, which has been out of print for what I imagine to be decades and is not on Spotify like the Goofy Movie soundtrack. Okay, so there's the framing. Let's look inside the picture. It seems that in between freshman year of high school and starting college, Max became a dedicated skateboarder with ambitions to go pro. There's no Roxanne in this movie. There's no power line. Both interesting choices, as they are probably the most memorable components of the original film, if the merchandise is anything to go by. Now, what child wants to watch a bunch of 19-year-olds navigate their first year at college, competing in a professional extreme sports championship? The answer was evidently me. In most Disney direct-to-video projects, I can see the vision. It's not much of a vision, but I can see it. They're bog-standard boilerplate half-baked movies meant to cater to the sensibilities of children. Your child likes Cinderella? They probably like pretty princesses and romance. Here's more pretty princesses and romance. Your kid likes Tarzan? They probably like funny talking monkeys and the jungle. So here's more of that. And in that sense, Extremely Goofy Movie does make sense. Your kid likes weirdly honest portrayals of the nuances of the father-son relationship when raising a millennial awash in the changing voice of what constitutes Americana? Well, uh, good news! I've always found Max Goof to be an incredibly interesting character. In Goof Troop, he occupies the standard characterization of any rambunctious little boy character. He's wacky, cutesy, and loves adventure and having fun. Goofy Movie took an interesting angle by making him significantly older and now much more cynical and resentful of his cringe fail father, painting this once pretty close relationship with Goofy as much more adversarial and challenging. I'd say that the weirdly adult tone of the sequel is jarring, but the original has this knack for presenting really mundane situations as incredibly dark just by making you really invested in the stakes of both Max's desire to get to the Powerline concert and his fraught relationship with Goofy. Still, I can't help but wonder what inspired the choices behind this movie. All of its elements feel kind of out of sync. The decidedly adult issues of starting and returning to college, as well as being fired from a job. Like, Goofy literally goes to the unemployment office. The experience of navigating campus life and joining a fraternity, that 70s nostalgia, the slam poetry. When this movie came out, I barely even understood what college was. As a result, it ended up kind of shaping my perception of what it was going to be, and I began getting preemptively stressed out that I was going to break my parents' hearts when I shipped off for that wild green yonder to sleep in a dorm and listen to slam. I used to have to fast forward through the scene where Goofy slowly meanders around his newly empty nest, picking up Max's old stuffed bear before breaking down in his now empty bedroom and sobbing into his gloved hand. Hands. That's so upsetting. There's something about the fact that all these storylines that revolved solidly around adult life transfixed me at five years old. I imagine it takes some real panache to grab a kid for a story about college and a midlife crisis, and this thing is the panachicle. That's, um, the pinnacle of a panache. I don't know if that was clear, sorry. Goofy Movie Prime was directed by Kevin Lima, who also co-directed Tarzan, and married Brenda Chapman, the co-director for The Prince of Egypt and Brave. What a tangled web we weave. Wait, no, neither of them directed Tangled. What a Tarzan web we weave. <laughs> The sequel, however, was directed by Douglas McCarthy, whose wheelhouse is usually television animation rather than feature films, which makes sense given that the DTV sequels were typically headed by the Disney television wing. The screenplay was crafted by the Pulitzer-worthy genius Scott Spencer Gordon, whose other work largely consists of writing credits on classic sitcoms like Saved by the Bell, Alf, and the Golden Girls. The year before this came out, he wrote the very goofy Christmas segment of Mickey's Once Upon a Christmas, which, you guessed it, also revolved around Max and Goofy's relationship, so he came prepared. It's worth noting that most of the Disney DTV sequels, like most animated films, had multiple writers on the screenplay. Tarzan 2 had four credited screenwriters, Simba's Pride had two, and by gosh, by golly, Return to Jafar had eight. Eight credited writers. Were they interpolating scripts or something here? I don't know. 
And the thing is, all jokes aside, Gordon did a great job. This movie is legitimately very funny, and I think it's only gotten funnier as I've gotten older. The humor is actually one of the things that makes it really stick out from other DTV sequels. It's quick, sometimes dry, and feels very ahead of its time in how it executes things like irony, self-awareness, and wordplay. Hmm. Do you ever wonder why we're always like, wearing gloves? And apart from the wit, a lot of the dialogue just feels really natural. There's so much about this movie that is very absurd, and yet a lot of the dialogue really does read like 19-year-olds shooting the shit. South, uh, no wait, I mean, uh, oh, I don't know, man, where I look like Magellan? PJ, you couldn't spell Magellan. Try hanging a Louie. No, 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 wait, that's the other Louie. It's a really fun juxtaposition to see Goofy quacking and yaha hooing and all that crap, while the younger characters talk like actual college students? Wow, that's pretty deep. Did you get that off a bumper sticker? Watching this movie really imparts the sense that the creative team was playing with all the dolls in their toy box in the way that just seemed the most fun. As a result, a lot of this doesn't even read as a Disney movie. It reads as like a college sex comedy, almost. Am I allowed to say that about a movie with Goofy in it? Making a movie for small children revolving primarily around the transition to college and the collegiate experience is strange enough, but they really lean into that narrative concept. You see the characters attend lectures, study for finals, do fraternity rituals, try to pick up women, move into their dorms, and otherwise generally navigate a very specific early adulthood experience in a way that frankly probably shouldn't appeal to little kids. But honestly, even when I was five, I found this way more fun to watch than the cartoony road trip stuff in a Goofy movie. In a way, it almost made me excited to grow up and go to college. This was my conception of the college experience for years. It made it look fun. Even the slam! None of the pieces of this film feel as if they should cohere, and yet they do. Even if you completely ignore the X Games product placement, of which there are many extended sequences. It's a very hodgepodge storyline. The beret girl stuff, Goofy's fling with Sylvia, the gamma fraternity drama. It's all so discordant, and yet it somehow knits itself together. Like, there's a scene where Max and his friends are hanging out at a nightclub where a cover of the reggae song Pressure Drop is playing, and then Goofy sneaks into the DJ booth and bribes him to play Peaches and Herbs so he and his librarian girlfriend can have an extended disco dance sequence. Sure, I buy this. You know, I, I buy it and I leave a little tip, actually. Here's a little dollar for you. Hmm. But of course, the writing is not the only avenue in which this movie soars. It's an animated film at the end of the day, and the animation behind this film fascinates me, because considering its budget, it is very good. Now naturally, that budget was much smaller than a Goofy movie, and as such, it's not nearly as polished. It lacks the highfalutin shading, backdrops, and overall zhuzh that is typically only reserved for theatrical releases. But you can really get the sense that even with those limitations, the art and animation team were really putting in the work to the best of their ability. I find the color palettes to be very visually pleasing. There's a lot of earth tones playing around with the lighting while still retaining just enough color and saturation to make things pop without boiling your eyeballs. The character designs are fun and memorable. But uh, there's one specific thing about the art of this movie that really sticks with me. The character animation is very good. For those of you who don't know, major characters in animated films typically have one principal animator who leads the charge for the animation of that specific character. For example, Disney legend Glenn Keane was the lead animator for The Beast and Tarzan, among others. And while the general animation in this film is pretty great, there is one character in particular who really jumps out at me every time I watch it. Bradley Uppercrust the Third. Bradley is the antagonist of an extremely goofy movie. He was introduced for this movie and so far solely exists in Disney canon in this movie. He is a smug, mean prep whose fraternity, the Gamma Moo Moos, Moo Moo, who wants to join a herd of cows? Did I read? Absolutely. Did I talk? Absolutely run the show at their college and dominate the X Games. Now, if you remember what I said earlier, the X Games have only existed since summer 1995, and this movie came out in February 2000, so to that I say a sophisticated and straightforward big fucking whoop. 
I'm getting off topic. Bradley is incredibly animated. He's bursting with spins and smears and squashes and stretches to the extent that I watch him and think, man, why were these animators showing off so hard? His face is like putty. Every single frame is a unique expression and it also makes for some really good reaction images. According to IMDb, the animators for Bradley included Andrew Brooks, David Costello, Randy Glusak, and at least five different people on in-betweens, and they were all Oscar-worthy to me. Thank you. Frankly, it's hard to segment this video because there are so many minuscule things about this film that make me scratch my head in the best way possible. What happened to Goof, man? So let's get to the rapid fire round about some things that fascinate me about an extremely goofy movie the most important entrant into the annals of cinema history. Okay, one of the Gammas looks like a college version of the Bigfoot from a Goofy movie. Goofy wears a leisure suit when he first enters the campus, I guess to onboard the general zest for 1970s Americana that runs throughout the film. And for some reason, he continues to wear it for several days after this, despite having a default outfit for his character model. One of the ESPN commentators fucking dies. Or at least that's implied, which is close enough. That's right, Chuck. This film makes it canon that both ESPN and Gilligan's Island exist in the Goofy cinematic universe. Goofy does manual labor in a factory, but apparently needs at least a bachelor's degree to get a job. What a stunning indictment of America. Get your fucking ass up and work. There is a scene where an evil rainbow Goofy does some Lucy in the Sky with Diamonds shit. That's so upsetting. Goofy tries to get Max to buy Mickey Mouse underwear. Okay, uh, slam poetry. Now an, I guess, interesting piece of trivia about this movie is that when it airs on television, it's edited. An extremely goofy movie came out in 2000, which obviously means it's a product of the pre-9-11 world. At the climax of the film, Bradley's plan to sabotage Max's team goes haywire, and it causes the giant red X that decorates the arena to collapse in flames, trapping fellow Gamma Tank inside, and creating an environment for a dramatic heroic rescue to cap off the film and cement Brad as a huge villain. This sequence was, last I remember, usually trimmed down in television airings because of how it kind of invokes unpleasant imagery so close after a similar event. According to Wikipedia, this scene gets skipped over on television airings to this day. The citation takes you to a leftist theory medium article about 9-11, the Oedipus complex, and liberal ideology through the lens of an extremely goofy movie. The world is so beautiful, isn't it? But okay, all of these strange things, to me, they add up to something great. The thing about a lot of Disney DTV sequels is that they're nothing. They're cliche, or bland, or inoffensive. They're phoned in, safe. An extremely goofy movie is an entirely different animal. It feels like creative people having fun with the assignment they were given, pushing it to its absolute limits to wring out as much fun as possible. Yeah! Yeah! It does really make you scratch your head sometimes, but I think being a little confused and entertained is way better than being totally bored. And apparently the animation industry agreed because the movie did win an Annie Award for Best Animated Home Video in 2000. And you might think, oh, who cares, that's a weak category. Yeah, well, that year its competition included another Disney film and Wacko's Wish. I am vindicated by the industry. Thank y'all. I'll tell you the truth. When I was a kid, a lot of the Disney directed video sequels just washed over me. Kids are smarter than you think when it comes to media consumption, in the sense that they can tell when something is lazy, even if they don't have the means to fully articulate that understanding yet. I rarely watch these movies more than a couple times, if I even bothered to watch them at all. But an extremely goofy movie didn't fall victim to that same fate. In fact, my obsession with this movie outpaced a lot of Disney's most beloved theatrical releases. Snow White and Sleeping Beauty would just collect dust as I sat through repeat showings of Max doing skateboard tricks. I'd watch it multiple times a week, sometimes multiple times a day. I'd sit in my room and hold my little kitty skateboard that I never actually rode, pretending I was right in the middle of the action. I loved the 70s throwback songs and the jokes and the emotional arcs. And when the credits played and the characters all danced to a Maxine Nightingale cover, I always felt compelled to dance right along with them. And maybe sometimes I did. I don't know if I could give you a single reason for all this, other than a few potential factors. Max was one of my favorite Disney characters. I was charmed by the all-new concept of college. I loved the music. But however it managed to do it, it did what any good movie is supposed to do. It struck a chord with me, on an emotional level. And maybe it did it because I was five. And maybe it only does now because it's nostalgic. 
But I will say that while I can now see a lot of the things I loved as a child as too babyish or low quality to fully nostalgize over, I will still gladly watch this movie start to finish if I get a chance to and enjoy every second. I'd even say it's gotten better with age. While researching this video, I began looking into the cast and crew to see if I could reach out to anyone who was involved. I particularly wanted to get a hold of screenwriter Scott Spencer Gordon because I felt like his writing is one of the things that truly elevates this film. When I looked him up, however, I found that Scott had passed away over a decade ago now, at the age of 56, after battling leukemia. Scott moved to LA from the East Coast to pursue screenwriting, and spent 20 years writing sitcoms and movies. He then spent more years teaching his craft to future generations at colleges and high schools. His resume is pretty robust. I don't know how he felt about writing a 79-minute direct-to-video Disney sequel that's more or less a totally unsubtle ESPN commercial and I probably never will. But I will admit that apart from the sadness for the tragedy of his loss, I'm also sad for the fact that I'll never get the chance to tell him that, no matter how he felt about that particular achievement, it impacted at least one kid in a way so large that they felt compelled to deliver a sermon over its greatness 24 years later. If there's one lesson I feel it can take away from an extremely goofy movie, it's that great art can take many forms. While I have a bit of a snobbish streak, I am, as always, committed to the idea that art is subjective. To most cultural critics, this unabashedly silly movie, made to do little more than boost VHS tape sales, is nowhere close to the title of fine art. But beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and I just happened to behold this movie at an age where it was both foreign and fascinating to me, and it's made this otherwise unassuming film pure gold in my eyes. It could just be the nostalgia, it could be the kernel of truth that even unsuspecting sources can produce great things, and it could be a bit of both. But I think if one thing in all of this is objective, it's that this movie is, if absolutely nothing else, extremely goofy. And I wouldn't have it any other way.